Porsche. Porsche is one of Germany's first sports automobile manufacturing companies. It's a brand we all recognize and admire, especially the Porsche 911. Today, Porsche is the face of luxury and powerful performance. But truly, not many of us know about the brand's modest early days. Today, we are going to dive deep into its history, where it started, how it grew, and why it was involved with Volkswagen, so let's dive right in. This story begins with a man named Ferdinand Porsche, and to some of our regular viewers, this name might ring a bell. He was the man featured in our Volkswagen's video. Ferdinand Porsche was born to Anna and Anton Porsche in Mayfersdorf in northern Bohemia, part of Austria-Hungary at the time, and today a part of the Czech Republic. He was a highly ambitious boy. As a teenager, he would spend most of his day at his father's repair shop, learning everything he possibly could about vehicles and would attend university at night. With that much dedication and work ethic, it came as no surprise that Ferdinand was offered multiple engineering jobs at local companies. At the age of 23, Ferdinand designed his first automobile, the Porsche P1 in 1898. This was a simple carriage that ran on electric motors. Later, in 1901, improving on his previous design, he created the first ever hybrid car, the loner Porsche Mixta Hybrid, the very car that helped them win several races. In 1902, Ferdinand Porsche was drafted into the army and was appointed as the chauffeur for Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Fortunately, he didn't stay for long and soon went back to manufacturing automobiles. In the 1920s, Ferdinand moved to Stuttgart, where he worked with Daimler on the production and design of the Mercedes-Benz SSK. He then founded his own company called Dr. Ing HCF Porsche GmbH in 1931. Initially, the company only offered motor vehicle development work and consulting and did not manufacture any cars under its own name. One of the first projects Ferdinand took on was from the German government to design a car for the people, what soon came to be known as a Volkswagen. And so, the Volkswagen Beetle, one of the most successful car designs of all time, was born. It was a creation that never left Ferdinand's mind. In fact, the Porsche 64 was developed in 1939 using many components from the Beetle. Everything was going great for the company. They were growing and expanding, but all good things come to an end. During World War II, Volkswagen production had to halt all car production and shift to the military versions of the models. Ferdinand even produced a few tanks. At the end of the war in 1945, the Volkswagen factory at KDF Stadt fell to the British. Ferdinand lost his position as chairman of the board of management to Ivan Hurst, a British army major. In Wolfsburg, the Volkswagen company magazine dubbed him the British major who saved Volkswagen. On 15 December of that year, Ferdinand was arrested for war crimes and even though he was not tried, Ferdinand was sentenced to 20 month imprisonment. But the mind of a Porsche never rests. His son Ferry Porsche took over and decided to build his own car to fit the standards he was raised to expect. And he didn't stop there. He took a liking to the company and helped it through a lot of difficulties. In 1947 July, design work began on the Type 356 under the direction of Ferry and head of construction Carl Rabe. The car shape was the work of car body constructor Erwin Commenda, the creator of the shape of the Volkswagen Porsche Type 60. Later that year in September, after being released, Ferdinand examined the design of the Cistalia racing car, the model constructed under the management of Ferry. His son had the same eye for detail. I would have built it exactly the same, right down to the last screw, he said. The 356 design concepts became a reality in the first half of 1948. Ferry decided on a partnership with Volkswagen Work, where Porsche could use the supply of the Volkswagen parts and its distribution network. Ferdinand couldn't have been prouder. His son was not only an outstanding engineer, but also a great entrepreneur. When Ferry returned the company to Stuttgart on April 6, 1950, the first Porsche 356 was produced. Unfortunately, later that same year, Ferdinand Porsche passed away at the age of 75. 
Before heading further into the story, let's talk a little about what inspired the logo. Now the creation isn't as clear as the company's. Some say that Ferry sketched the crest on a napkin during a meal with American Porsche distributor Max Hoffman at a New York restaurant. Meanwhile, many Germans disagree, believing the emblem was designed by engineer Franz Xaver Reimpies. While the creator of the company logo is debatable, what's certain is that it was based on the free people state of Württemberg's coat of arms. Porsche's headquarters were, and still are, located in Stuttgart, which was Württemberg's capital. In 1952, not long after the development of West Germany, Württemberg Baden and Württemberg Hohenzollern merged into the federal state of Baden-Württemberg. Now, the old coat of arms is Porsche's famed crest and a piece of Germanic history. Getting back to post-war Germany, parts were generally in short supply, so the 356 automobiles used components from the Volkswagen Beetle, including the engine case from its internal combustion engine, transmission, and several parts used in the suspension. In 1964, after a fair amount of success in motor racing with various models, including the 550 Spider and with the 356 needing a major redesign, the company launched the Porsche 911, another air-cooled rear-engine sports car, this time with a six-cylinder boxer engine. The team to lay out the body shell design was led by Ferry Porsche's eldest son, Ferdinand Alexander Porsche. About a decade later in 1972, Porsche's KG was transformed into AG, which means that it went from a limited partnership to a public limited company. Now we're not exactly sure why this happened, but some say that Ferry and his sister Louise Piège felt their children wouldn't be a synergistic team. So instead, an executive board was formed, all with members outside the Porsche family running the company, alongside a supervisory board of Porsche family members. As Porsche was converted into a public company in 1972, and their family members stepped down from their positions, Ferry Porsche retired from direct leadership and continued as the head of the supervisory board. And so, from 6 November 1976, Porsche was directed by Professor Ernst Fuhrmann. Over the next few decades, Porsche continued to work on models post the popular 911, but none could live up to its name and achievements. The car that came as a complete shocker to the Porsche enthusiasts would have to be the first four-wheel drive introduced in 2002, the Porsche Cayenne. Porsche was always known for its sporty designs, and although people were highly skeptical of their new car, the car lived up to the mark and was highly appreciated by the public. In August 2009, Porsche SE and Volkswagen AG reached an agreement that the car manufacturing operations of the two companies would merge in 2011 to form an integrated automotive group. Volkswagen agreed to hand over close to 51% of its shares in exchange for taking Porsche's management positions. In this way, Volkswagen ultimately remained in control. To date, the brand has been growing. They even claim to have the highest profit per unit sold of any car company in the world. On 11 May 2017, Porsche built their 1 million 911. To celebrate this, an Irish green Carrera S was built, ready for a global tour before becoming a permanent resident at the Porsche Museum in Stuttgart. Porsche is still at the leading edge of performance and technology, with supercars like the 918 Spyder and the GT3 RS continuing their proud tradition of innovation. Not to mention their more luxurious models like the Panamera and the Cayenne, satisfying the needs of those who prefer sophistication with their acceleration. And let's not forget their racing cars, which for many years have given Porsche a trophy cabinet the envy of every one of their peers. If 
you enjoyed this video, consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons. It does wonders for the YouTube algorithm so more people can see our videos and so that you can be notified when we launch our next video. We try and put out at least one new one per week and as you can imagine, the research and editing alone of these type of videos takes us close to 18 hours. So we would really appreciate it if you could also check out our Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can support our work. We produce over 12 videos per month, so that is literally 8 cents per video. Thank you so much and we'll see you at our next unmasking.